Jason Woodlock, thank you so much for joining us on the East West Football Podcast. How are you? Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate your time. So let's start off and let's talk about the NFL offseason. More specifically about the Kansas City Chiefs, obviously coming off a tough loss against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. What have you thought of their offseason move so far? Uh, you know, I, I'm still haven't recovered from the Super Bowl, to be quite honest with you, and haven't I, I'm concerned about how the uh Britt Reed situation has impacted the Chiefs, Andy Reed's son involved in a car accident before the Super Bowl and how I think that impacted the Chiefs' Super Bowl performance. And and now, you know, the Chiefs head into the offseason and they're starting over at offensive tackle, both right and left, with Mitchell Schwartz and Eric Fisher both basically being let go or being allowed to leave. Uh, and I've seen people, you know, speculate, like, is their Super Bowl window over? And I'm like, wow, they got Patrick Mahomes. They got Tyreek Hill. They got Travis Kelsey. How can the Super Bowl window be over? They, they have Andy Reid. But, you know, Super Bowl windows can close that fast. And I just think the, the events with Britt Reid perhaps could shake up the team. Uh, you know, because I was looking at this Chiefs team as a, as a dynasty, and I thought for sure uh, we were going to win a second Super Bowl, and then Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes would be off and running. But the, you know, they lose to Tampa and and uh, have challenges with their offensive line and just the chemistry. And so I, I'm concerned uh, about you know what, what we're going to see from the Chiefs uh, next year. What do you feel, what position do you feel they need to address in the draft or in free agency still? Well, I think obviously I'm a former offensive lineman. And, you know, anytime you have a, a quarterback like Patrick Mahomes, uh, you know, it all starts with protection and it being the key for, uh, you know, that passing offense. And so I, I would think that, you know, they're going to address uh, the offensive tackle position in the draft and, uh, you know, Eric Fisher was a first round pick, the top pick in the draft, I mean, it was seven, eight years ago or whatever. Uh, and so I would imagine they'll, they'll start there or, you know, hope they start there. Obviously, one of the biggest offseason stories has been Deshaun Watson, uh, you know, wanting to trade out of the Houston. And now we got a whole another situation unraveling. So I would like to get your thoughts on that. Uh Man, it's tough. I mean, because people are saying all kinds of crazy things. Does Texans ownership, are, 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 are they happy or were they somehow involved in the off-field issues? I certainly don't believe that. Uh, they gave Deshaun Watson a $150, $160 million contract. There's no way they would be trying to devalue this guy's trade value or trying to damage an asset that they invested that much money in. And it's, it's uh, even though Deshaun Watson wants out and has been a bit of a headache for them, uh, I can't see them doing anything to damage Deshaun Watson. It would make no sense. Uh, it, it's been, you know, Deshaun Watson been one of my favorite players and someone that I thought was headed to superstardom. There were moments where I thought that Deshaun Watson, other than Patrick Mahomes, was going to be the best quarterback in the NFL. And I know that they, you know, let DeAndre Hopkins go. And I know that Bill O'Brien did a bad job as general manager. But I was shocked they only won four games last year. And and I know <clears throat> having an interim coach and Romeo Cornell and, again, losing your top wide receiver and just – uh, Bill O'Brien not running the team that well, but four wins is four wins. I don't care what the situation is around you. That's not a great look for Deshaun Watson. And then for Deshaun Watson to come off a four-win season and then say, I want the hell up out of here, come hell or high water, and then be uh, sideswiped or caught off guard by this entire off-field situation involving, you know, allegations of uh, 
I guess sexual assault is what they're saying, but these aren't criminal charges. Sexual harassment uh, with all these masseuse. His reputation is being remade right before our eyes and not in a good way. And I look at the entire situation and just arrogance. Uh, Deshaun Watson is represented by David Mulligetta, uh, probably the most arrogant uh, player agent uh, I've seen. And, you know, he's right up there with Drew Rosenhaus. But Mulligetta now having represented uh, Dwayne Haskins in Washington, that was a disaster of immaturity on <laughs> Dwayne Haskins' part. And now representing Deshaun Watson, who let's say he didn't do anything criminal. He certainly has put himself uh, in a terrible position based on his immaturity, lack of sophistication. Uh, it's right there in the Dwayne Haskins look camp, just stupidity at the very least. Uh, and Mulligetta represents both of these guys. And so I, I just, you know, my image of Deshaun Watson before this season, before the four-win season, and certainly before these mm -hmm. allegations were, hey, this was one of Dabo Sweeney's guys, one of the most mature, uh, ready to take on the challenge of being an NFL superstar, any, you know, any young quarterback. And now my whole perception is completely different. Uh you know, this guy looks immature, he looks arrogant, and he looks, you know, to some degree predatory until uh, we hear otherwise, until the other side of this case comes out. Or, or you know, there's, more, I guess, 20-some-odd women now with different allegations. It's just not a great look for Deshaun Watson. Do you believe he'll be traded? Uh, I, l let me kind of throw it back to you all a little bit. Would you trade for him? With all this hovering <laughs> over him right now, you would have to be really ballsy. Uh, you know, his mom would have to be general manager of a team in order for me to trade for him. Somebody that like really knows him and believes in his innocence. But if I'm some other general manager right now, I don't think I can trade for Deshaun Watson. Not, a, you know, the kind of contract he's got and uh, you you know, we're in this Me Too era. Uh, you know, there's got to be some clarity and some uh, exoneration of Deshaun Watson before I'm willing to trade for him. I, would you trade for him? Well, it's reported that multiple teams are still interested. Uh, I mean, personally, me, no. I would wait till everything's <laughs> clear to trade for him, but... You know, as far as other NFL teams, it looks like they are still uh, interested. Yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't do it. That This is like, uh, you know, catching your spouse coming out of the doctor's office for STDs and then you just going to hop back in bed with them? I, I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to wait. Let that penicillin take hold first. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's good on with you, Jason? First, I want to thank you for that. coming on. No word. Um, I want to ask, what, what has what has Jason Whitlock been up to since Fox Sports? Uh, since Fox Sports, you know, I I was with Outkick briefly, and uh, you know, that was going well, and 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 then I left. Uh, but I would say I'm about a week or two away from announcing what I'm going to be doing next. And so what I've been doing here the last several months is just the due diligence on what I'm going to do next and who I'm going to be working with next and making sure that I have all the I's dotted and T's crossed and uh, make sure that, you know, I'm doing exactly what I want to be doing and have enough control to do it at a high level. Uh, so I've just been preparing for the next chapter. I'm excited about the next chapter, and I think, you know, I'll be announcing the next chapter here in the next week or two. That's some great stuff there, Jason. Man, I've been I, literally did, I, I did, like, today, as we're taping, I just came back from Los Angeles. Uh, I went out there and taped some commentaries for uh, PragerU, uh, somewhat related to sports or whatever. So, I don't know. I've just been hanging out and trying not to get fat. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, I mean, fat, -er. I mean, fat -er. 
I'm trying not to get fatter. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I've been a huge fan of yours since your days at ESPN and watching you with, you know, Tony Kornheitz on the PTI show. And then I followed you, you know, to FS1. I see you on with Colin sometimes and I'll speak for yourself. How do you feel that speak, speak for yourself? The show has grown since you left. Uh, I'm not the greatest person to ask that question uh, because I haven't watched enough mm -hmm. to have an informed opinion. Uh, I'm happy for Marcellus mm -hmm. and, and Uncle Jimmy and that the show has, Darnell, the show has continued on, but I'm not an expert on uh, what's been going on with the show since I left. I've been off in my own little world. Yeah. Why do you think Jason gets a bad, Jason Will, I guess, a bad rep a lot of times from the media? Is it because you're, you're as real as you are or it's just, it's just you're different, you know, you're different from everybody else? Yeah, I think, you know, I kind of have a biblical understanding of the world. And mm -hmm. uh, look, man, people aren't really fond of the truth. And, and it's not that I have some lock on the truth that no one else does. I'm just willing to speak it more than most. And I think that social media has gone to war with the truth and people want more than anything to be popular on social media. Media people want to be popular on social media. They want the follows, the likes, the retweets, because their bosses are watching and it impacts their leverage and career. I'm not someone that wants to be popular over social media. Uh, I want to be a journalist. Uh, I want to be someone that always says exactly what they believe. And that's not how you become popular over social media. You have to jump on board with whatever the popular group think is. And that's never going to be me. And I think that others in the media uh, have more responsibility than I do in terms of people, my peers, for the most part, all are married with kids. Uh, and so they're not as free as me. And so I can take more risk. I can be more honest. I can basically tell social media to F off and not sit around and worry like, oh my God, how's this going to impact my career? Uh, because, you know, I've been blessed. I've made a significant amount of money, could take care of myself, but also there's less for me to take care of because it's, it's just me. Uh, and I do have some family that, you know, I certainly help out or whatever, but uh, I just think that, you know, in this era where, Everybody is supposed to go on social media and say America is a terrible place and uh, as a black man, you have no chance and the police are all killing us. I just can't say that because that's not my reality. And, uh, you know, many people in the sports media, particularly uh, the black people in the sports media or whatever, uh, they all love to pretend like they're from the black community or from uh, a poor background. Uh, but I th most of it's bullshit. They're, they're spoiled elites have been pampered their whole life. And they wouldn't say the shit that they say if they really came from places where, you know, great masses of black people live. I, you know, my dad built a business in the black community my whole life. Me and my dad lived in the black community. The Masterpiece Lounge, my dad's boy. Again, none of them people, nobody was in there in the Masterpiece Lounge in the neighborhoods that I grew up in. Like, oh my God, the police are out to get us. That just wasn't the case. You know, the Junebug and Big D and the Disciples or Bloods and Crips, they may have been out to get us. <laughs> And so I'm just not going to get on social media or on the media and just lie about the shit that's really impacting uh, the black community. Uh, others have to do that. Uh, I don't. And so it makes me unpopular. And I, I'm, I'm sorry for getting maybe to, I don't, do y'all cuss on this podcast? I apologize if you don't. That's all right. It's your time. <laughs> just, so go ahead. Just, just be you, be you. <laughs> but Jason, uh, 
what is one of your what is one of your greatest memories that rather say ESPN or on FS1 that you that you can remember? Huh. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm gonna answer it a little different. One of the things I'll remember uh, uh, my days at Fox Sports is just uh, being able to get to a spot where I could take a kid like Darnell Smith who grew up in the same neighborhood I grew up in in Indianapolis, mm -hmm. went to my high school, was a football star at my high school, went to my college, Ball State, and was a star at Ball State. I was able to take that guy at 24, 25 years old and bring him out to Los Angeles, give him an opportunity, put him on TV. Uh, that's an awesome feeling. I was able to uh, take Jimmy Dodds, Uncle Jimmy, friend of mine for 20 years in Kansas City, used to call my radio show. That's how I met him. He was a caller to a local radio show I was doing in Kansas City and then became a character on my radio show and just someone that worked with me in radio in Kansas City. And I was able, he was uh, uh, working in the sheriff's department in Kansas City, Kansas for 17 years when I was like, Jimmy, I want you to come out here to L.A. and play this character, Uncle Jimmy, on my TV show. So I took him out of a jail in Kansas <laughs> and put him on TV in Los Angeles. <laughs> and he put the work in and showed the comedic talent because he was always a little part-time comedian. That's, you know, that's what's, what he started out calling my show, doing comedy bits and radio. And to be able to take that and put it on national TV on FS1 and give him that opportunity. Those are, you know, the two things to help a kid out from the, you know, mirrored my rise and then to help a friend out, uh, help him reach his comedic dreams and do a great job on the show. Just being able to help people uh, move up the ladder and realize their dreams. Uh, that That's what I remember about, you know, being on television and, uh, just helping people. That's some good stuff there, Jason. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Jason. Well, thank you again for joining us and uh, can't wait to hear your announcement here in a couple of weeks. Thank you guys for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you.